Hey guys, and welcome to another educational video. It's also a walk-in Wednesday because today is Thursday and these guns all arrived yesterday, all part of one collection that somebody sent me unexpectedly. So I had in my mind videos that I wanted to do and this was not one of them. This was really unplanned, kind of like my middle child. Because these came in and I've already done uh, videos on Luger, I did a complete video just on the development of the Luger. I also did a complete video just on the Krigoff. I never planned on doing a video just of commercial Lugers, but that's what these are. This is a collection of commercial Lugers. Now let me just say a little bit about that because we do have a number of people who write and say, I don't want to own anything Nazi. I, I certainly understand that. I don't blame you. I, I understand if it's uncomfortable, don't, don't buy Nazi guns. But on the other hand, the uh, Nazi guns, uh, I have to back up. On one of my videos, we said Nazi guns and the nomenclature police of the internet said there's no such thing as a Nazi gun. A Nazi gun implies that they belong to the Nazi party and uh, guns can't have an ideology. I just wanna clarify, when I say Nazi guns, I mean Nazi era. And I'm, I apologize for not using the word era. I assume that you knew that these guns were not able to march in a parade and join the party, but um, the guns uh, are, they do have Waffen stamps on them and they were issued to the German army during the Nazi era. So whenever I say Nazi guns, I just want to clarify, um, I mean Nazi era guns. They did not uh, technically join the Nazi party. So this collector, I don't know his, uh, his ideology in terms of Nazi guns, but Everything he sent me was commercial. And I thought, hey, this is a great time to just do a quick overview of some of these commercial guns. Now, one of the things I notice about commercial guns is, uh, first of all, they're usually in much better condition. Um, they're usually in much better condition because obviously they were sold to individuals who stuck them in a drawer. They never went to war, most likely, and they weren't used a lot. So often the commercial guns are actually in better shape than the military guns. Secondly, they're also a little bit cheaper. Uh, the, the Nazi era guns are actually more popular and the prices tend to increase uh, over time. They tend to be, uh, tend to be a, a, a good investment and they have an interesting history. That's, that's all I'll say, just interesting history. Some, some people are very offended by the Nazi history. I believe that is something that we should talk about, but I totally respect the fact if you disagree. The third thing about commercial guns is they often uh, came in 30 caliber, actually 7.65, 30 caliber Luger. Um, in, uh, I would say the majority of the commercial guns come in 30 caliber and therefore the nine millimeter uh, sell for a little bit more because their production numbers are a little lower. The military, of course, preferred the 9mm, made all their guns in 9mm, but the commercial guns uh, more frequently came in 30 caliber, and, but also came in 9mm. So let's, uh, let's go through the line and uh, point out some other characteristics. So as we scan through this, uh, this uh, lineup, uh, this is a 1900, these are 1906. Notice the, uh, the grip safety. So 1900, 1906, uh, but then we go to the 1908, which uh, is, is the final variation where they, do not, they don't have uh, the, the uh, grip safety. Uh, there is some anomalies, such as I did show you a, a later Swiss, and this one is a Portuguese, which we'll talk about, but a special contract uh, during World War II, the Portuguese ordered some, and they did prefer the grip safety. Um, you'll also notice that many of the commercial guns have no uh, stock lug. Uh, for obvious reasons, they weren't selling stocks to the public. The ones that do have a stock lug, it's because they were made for the military, but then diverted to the public, which I'll talk about. Let's start with the first one, which you should be familiar with. If I tip these up, this is a 1900 American Eagle commercial, went to the United States. Uh, the trigger guard is wider on the 1900. These early 1900 had a wider trigger guard, then later they went to a, th a thinner. And then they all, I'm looking down the line, all of them have this thinner trigger guard. So the, the characteristics of a 1900 versus a 1906 are very distinct. It has the wider trigger guard and it has the dish toggle. I've already talked about that in one of my videos. This one was made by DWM. This is the American Eagle, which is a marketing strategy to sell to different countries. They often would put the crest 
of that country. In this case, they picked the American Eagle. Uh, and then you'll also notice 30 caliber, you'll take my word for it. And these are Germany marked. Now there are test ones that are not, but I'm only gonna talk about commercial, 1900, uh, sold to the United States. Now in 1900, of course, we were not at war with Germany. Uh, Germany was a industrial economy that was growing. And so they were making products. And in particular, the DWM factory made Lugers. And this is one of the early ones, an American Eagle. They're also Swiss. Uh, he did not have a Swiss that he sent me, but we do have Swiss on the website. Uh, the Swiss has the Swiss cross. I actually have one right here. Not, not real clear because some of the, the white uh, wax is coming out. We do have a picture of a 1900 Swiss cross, um, and it's on our website right now, not part of this collection. And this is the 1906, comes in 30 caliber. The Swiss, uh, throughout the Swiss contracts, they preferred the 7.65 over the 9 millimeter. Even up to the 1930s, they still used the grip safety. They also have a distinct magazine. It has the little metal insert. Uh, that's a, a German, typical German. Uh, and this is only the Swiss. That's a Swiss magazine. It's unique to the Swiss Lugers. And just look at the condition of this one. Again, 1906, beautiful straw parts. Um, the fire blue, fire blue on the grip screw. You can see here, fire blue, beautiful straw parts. Just a beautiful Swiss Luger from the 1906 era. Now we skip two. Let's take a look at this one. This is also 1906, just a standard commercial. Uh, standard commercial Luger, uh, made before uh, World War I, so it's one of the earlier ones. And you uh, remember we talked about halos, the serial number on the bottom of the barrel, you can see halos, or just like a little shadow around the um, proof mark. That tells me it's original finish. Uh, gorgeous gun, now this one is in nine millimeter which makes it a little more valuable. Nine millimeter commercial is kind of a rare gun. Uh, some, sometimes they call this a fat barrel because um, the more typical ones were a skinnier barrel. You can notice the nine millimeter has a fatter barrel, the 30 caliber has a skinner, skinnier, a little longer barrel, and then look at the front sights, they're slightly different. This front sight actually you can see a little bit of fire blue, so it's a unique characteristic. So these again are early 1906 um, models and one in nine millimeter. This one is much more common. Um, and you can see again, the beautiful color, the fire blue, fire blue. And this is a 30 caliber, uh, typical commercial. Now, one of the things that you'll notice about these early commercials, is some of them went to uh, Germany uh, but a lot of them were made for export. These two that I just covered, uh, do not, they're, not Germ uh, they're not Germany marked, so that means it went to the domestic market in Germany. All the ones made for export, you'll see a Germany marked. Here's, here's an example, it's, um, it's in 30 caliber. Uh, again, a beautiful gun, marked Germany, which means it was made for export, most likely to the United States. Can't say for sure, but um, you can just see, again, a beautiful gun. This one is 1908 because there is no grip safety. And this one is the more common Germany label. Most of them, the Germany label is right there and much smaller. It's a little bit less intrusive than this Germany mark. So I, I haven't seen too many with that Germany mark. Most of them just have a small Germany mark right here. Again, 30 caliber, probably sent to the United States, made by DWM. Okay, that brings us right to um, this particular section, actually this whole section. These are a little bit unique in that they were marked by the retail company. So, for example, if, um, if Cabela's wanted to order their, uh, a, a large number of Lugers and put their logo on it, uh, they would, they would uh, as a retailer, uh, they could do that. Um, the factory would send them to you and put Cabela's on there, again, as a marketing strategy. Uh, but a little more modern example would be a lot of PPs and PPKs came into the United States. Uh, they were brought in by Innerarms. And at some point, 
um, you will see inner arms marked. They, uh, inner arms put their logo right on the gun. Some people uh, prefer they not do that. Um, but of course, the company wants to advertise that they are the exclusive importers of PPs and PPKs, and that happened in the 60s and 70s. Uh, inner arms of Alexander, Alexandria, Virginia. These guns, uh, and this is just, this is the unique part of this opportunity. Um, I see commercial guns all the time, and again, they're beautiful guns. They sell for a little bit less, so they're a lot more affordable. But then there are, are specific guns that went to importers. Um, most of them are, have just little tiny markings like this one. And I had never heard of this importer. This says uh, F.W. Vandry Company in Hamburg. So this is a, a retail uh, outfit. It would probably not be a small shop. It'd probably be a, a pretty big retailer for sporting goods. I uh, didn't look them up, but uh, the first time I ever saw that one. I've also seen Abercrombie & Fitch, uh, usually marked in the exact same style, but under here. Those sell for a lot of money, um, and I'm told that the catalog did not come with illustrations of emaciated boys and girls, but in this case, uh, they actually sold sporting goods along with a lot of other items, but Abercrombie & Fitch will be right here, and they're very, uh, they're very expensive, hard to find. So this one, I'm not sure what the price point will be, but that's pretty rare. It does come in 30 caliber, as I mentioned. Just a beautiful gun. DWM and, and a uh, retailer. Here's the next retailer uh, that I had also not heard of, but silly me, I should have. This says Low & Company in Obendorf, uh, which is where the factory was. The DWM factory was in Obendorf, uh, a large industrial uh, town, a lot of munitions. But uh, the reason I should have known uh, Low & Company, I actually Googled it and said, oh, I never heard of them. Uh, and that's embarrassing. And maybe you join me and say, I didn't realize this. When I looked it up, Low & Company was actually the parent company of DWM. Low & Company um, owned DWM when they made the Borchardt. They were a mercantile firm, but they also got into all kinds of things like uh, electricity, armaments. They were the first like true GE. They did a little bit of everything, but they owned DWM. They later spun it off, um, and so Mr. Borchardt and George Luger worked for Low & Company. So they eventually spun off DWM, the armaments part of the business. Um, the uh, Low fa family was Jewish, and so they ran into a lot of per uh, persecution, and the company was later broken up. But this, at that time that this was made, this was a retailer who was selling the Luger in one of their merchant stores, um, and it was made by D D DWM, which was actually a subsidiary of Low & Company. You can see the fire blue. They all come with blank wood bottoms. Uh, they should be blank wood bottoms. You'll see on all of these, they're not numbered. The military numbered them. The commercial guns were not numbered. This has no Germany mark on it. So I assume it was made for the German market. We'll take a look at this side. Beautiful gun. DWM, Low & Company in o Obendorf. Again, 30 caliber. Even more interesting. I've, I find this just fascinating. I hope you will too. Uh, some of you might have heard of AF Stoger Company. Again, a big mercantile store out of New York. Uh, they imported their own Lugers. They also, uh, you'll see PPs. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen a PPK, but I've owned PPs that are AF Stoger marked. And so they put the store name right on it. This happens to be an artillery Luger and would have been post-World War I. So here's what happened. At the end of World War I, of Treaty of Versailles, they could no longer uh, sell these. So they took the, instead of throwing the parts away for the artillery Luger, they put them together for commercial market and sold this one to New York. And I'm told that they were very popular uh, among shooters because of their accuracy. But you can see the Germany mark, AF Stoger, and a uh, registration patent office uh, logo. So AF Stoger, and they came in um, all different sizes. They had a four inch, they had a six inch, an eight inch. And I've even seen AF Stogers with a barrel about yay long. Uh, odd looking things, but again, uh, uh, popular in the American markets and sell for uh, some serious money today. So this is an artillery Luger made for World War I, 
but uh, after the war sold to Stoger because Germany needed the money. And, um, and here's another example, which probably you've never seen. I've seen a few of these. This is Pacific Arms of San Francisco. So again, a retailer, Pacific Arms, imported guns, the exact same thing. You can see Germany on the barrel. This one is shorter. This is more of a Navy style um, because the barrel is a little bit shorter. It doesn't have the Navy. It doesn't have the Navy sight, but I'll, I'll show you that. So Pacific Arms uh, imported less than AF Stoger. So these are a little more rare than the uh, AF Stoger. Both of them very popular and uh, can, can bring some serious money. I'm thinking about $4,500. Uh, this one comes in nine millimeter and the artillery comes in nine millimeter. And the reason it would is um, people liked it. But more importantly, the leftover parts from the war were all in nine millimeter. So they just uh, made lemonade out of lemons by taking the parts and selling them in, uh, into the United States market. This would have been after World War I and before World War II. So speaking of a Navy style, here's an actual Navy Luger. You can see the Navy markings. Um, definitely made for World War I, World War I Navy. Um, this is a 1906 Navy. Uh, you can even see the property mark for uh, some of you people who have the resources can probably tell me who this was issued to but it is uh, Roman numeral 2 MD. I, I can look it up, but maybe you can tell me. So this is a DWM, Navy Luger, extended barrel, nine millimeter. It, uh, it has the Navy markings on it, but it was later refinished. This is uh, refinished uh, post-war and sold into the commercial market. Uh, this, this concentric circle magazine is distinctly navy. Um, and here is another one. Same thing, uh, again, with the navy. Look at the rear sight. It has an adjustable 100 meter, 200 meter. All you do is push the button and pull back, and you're at 200 meters. So it's an adjustable navy sight, has an extended barrel. Um, while this one is navy marked, this one is not. So in other words, this one was actually made for the Navy, but the war ended, so then they, do, they sold it in the commercial market. Uh, this one never made it to the Navy because all it has is a commercial crown end proof on it. Um, fire blue, pro again, when, when it was diverted to the commercial market, it was probably refinished. Looks a lot better. This does have concentric circle, but no number. Remember, uh, military, they would have the Navy magazine, but no number on the bottom because it never went to the military. No Navy markings, Crown N, and Germany marked. So this was probably, this was probably sold in the U.S. market. It, of course, comes in 9mm because, it, it, again, it is a Navy Luger sold in the commercial market. Okay, so there's only three left on the table. Oh, and then I'm just going to say something about the holsters. Three left on the table. This one probably belongs over here, but because it had a wooden magazine, I, I put it with these. Um, but I'm not sure what this is. I do think it's a commercial gun, and I would call it a Frankenstein. Um, so here we know uh, it is for the commercial market. Well, it has, uh, yes, yeah, so it would be for the commercial market because it's crown and proofed. Uh, and there's really no other markings on this gun. Uh, look, there's not even, I don't know if it was made by Mauser or Krigoff or DWM. It does come in 9mm. Um, it has another crown end proof here. Um, but what is it? It does have a stock lug. It has a wooden bottom that's numbered. But here's one clue. Uh, those of you who watch the Krigoff video, we have a Krigoff stamp right here. So I, I would think that this was put together from parts, maybe at the end of the war. So leftover parts from Krigoff and all uh, sundry other places. Uh, looks like a uh, Krig, maybe a Krigoff frame. Yeah, it looks like a Krigoff frame to me. Um, and it, it, the number is not post-war. Um, the post-war ones, if you watch my video, they had a much bigger font. Uh, this one is, looks like the, the wartime font. So this is a Frankenstein put together from all different parts, uh, 
no Kragoff logo here, no date. It even looks like it might have been um, buffed off because this looks, this looks a little bit buffed right here. So that just tells me that probably they had a bunch of parts at the end of the war. They were desperate to put them together. So they just threw this one together. It is number 451 and it has a wooden bottom magazine. The, the grips are very worn, but not marked in any way. So this could be commercial or it could have gone to the military at the end of the war. These two are World War II era and you can tell right away because they have the aluminum bottom magazine. Yes, they did make com commercial guns at the Mauser factory. The commercial guns had the Mauser banner. This one is dated 42. It is in nine millimeter. It does have the Black Widow style grip and it has straw parts, which in 42, they would not have been straw. The magazine is numbered to the gun, but this is considered a commercial Mauser banner World War II era Luger. Uh, a very rare gun, uh, very, very cool to look at, and this is one I would consider keeping for myself uh, just because it's just a beautiful example of a commercial. There's no military markings, just the Eagle End proof. But over here where you would normally see the, um, the proof marks for the military, there are no proof marks. It did not go to the police. It was sold in the commercial market. Uh, sometime after, um, sometime in 1942 or immediately thereafter. Uh, this final one, uh, I mentioned that the Portuguese, uh, this is GNR, which went to the, um, the Portuguese guard, uh, worked uh, basically a military slash police uh, gun. Mauser banner, so uh, made by Mauser in the World War II period. The only proof marks will be here, a crown U, which is probably 34 and 38, uh, was the contract for the Portuguese Luger. This actually comes, like the Swiss, they ordered it in 30 caliber. They ordered the uh, grip safety feature. Uh, this is in, most of these Portuguese are pretty well used, uh, beat up, um, because they went to the Portuguese and then were exported to other countries, heavily used. Uh, this one is in better shape than most. One more thing uh, before we conclude here. A couple of these came with holsters. So a commercial holster, basically, uh, these are, again, World War I era. So there's no stitching right here. Uh, just as a reminder, when I did the Luger video, I said World War I had no stitching here um, across the middle. Uh, World War II, this is a 41. They did add the extra stitching here. So immediately I can see this is World War I era. But how do I know it's not military? It's because there's no markings at all. Um, if you remember World War I, uh, they would be marked here, or they would be marked here, or they would be marked here. This one has no marking at all. So this is, this is your typical uh, commercial 1920s era uh, holster. And so several of, several of these Lugers came with a holster that looked like this. Hey guys, thanks for watching. Even though this was un unplanned and unexpected, um, I hope it was worthwhile for you. I learned a few things um, and I hope you did too. Uh, and thank you to the, uh, the viewer who sent me their collection. Uh, they were just getting up in years and decided it was time to uh, uh, move uh, a lot of their collection. And certainly if you're at that point in your life where you wanna move some of your guns, uh, let us know, we'd be glad to help you out. Uh, but please make sure you like and subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you're notified when I do something new and unexpected.